Dr. June, yesterday at the Immuno-Oncology 360 event, one of our speakers, Mark Simon, uh, shared a story about Dr. Jim Allison, who had said that 10 years ago when he was invited to speak at conferences, he would get some sort of crummy little room in some obscure part of the venue and was lucky if 10 people were in the room to listen to him. So I want to ask you, as a person who got involved in immuno-oncology in the early 1980s, what did you see that so many of us didn't see? Um, <laughs> so I was fortunate to start my training in oncology at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center where bone marrow transplantation was invented. And at the time, we thought it worked because of what's called super lethal chemotherapy. So in a bone marrow transplant, in leukemia patients, the way it's done is you find a donor and then the patient gets literally lethal chemotherapy and radiation, mm -hmm. of which the public's learned about that that, I mean, actually eradicates your bone marrow uh, for things like uh, Chernobyl and other, mm -hmm. you know, the recent Fukushima thing in, in Japan. So radiation is extremely toxic to the bone marrow and that's used as a weapon there and it was thought for at least 10 years that the reason bone marrow transplants worked was because of that, that, that you got more radiation and chemotherapy, and then you would rescue the patient mm -hmm. with the donor bone marrow, mm -hmm. and the stem cells would come in. And then the Fred Hutchinson did an amazing experiment. They compared a series of patients who had brother-sister bone marrow transplants or identical twins. Okay. So the same amount of chemotherapy and radiation was given, and they found it's completely opposite. They did this experiment because they thought if you had the better the match. So an identical twin is the best you can have. And it turns out it was actually opposite. That you did better if your donor was not an identical twin. So then they said, okay, well the chemotherapy is the same. The radiation is the same. It must be the immune system is what's different between brother-sister versus identical twin. So that's when they then went back to the drawing board and looked, and it's actually the incoming T cells that maintain a long-term response in, in that setting. So, and we now know that those patients on those early bone marrow transplant uh, trials, if they didn't relapse in a year or two, they were cured. So the first true immunotherapy really was given in the form of a bone marrow transplant. Okay. okay. And so I was able to see that. And then the issue is, well, how do you get from doing a bone marrow transplant where you have another donor and all, could you do it with the patient themselves? And that's really where we're at with CAR T cells and so on. It's using the patient's own immune system mm -hmm. and then genetically engineering that. Okay, so how widely available today is T cell therapy? Right now in trials by another number of pharmaceutical and biotech companies. So it's actually ahead of schedule. The first patients weren't treated until 2010 and you can find numbers that when you do a phase one trial, it's, a, it's an average of eight to 12 years until you get FDA approval. And Novartis has announced that they expect leukemia, you know, to apply to the FDA by the end of 2016. So presumably, you know, there will be FDA approval in 2017. So right now, the only availability is on experimental trials. Okay. And it should become, you know, FDA approved in the U.S. and then maybe a year later in Europe and other around the world. So okay. it's actually ahead of schedule compared to many other drug development, but it's unfortunate right now we're at this time where it's not after approved and there's not there's more patients than there is therapy available. Right. And the trials are where predominantly? Basically they're at centers and you can find out on clinicaltrials.gov mm -hmm. where they list exactly the places. And there are places where in general there's been deep experience with bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. Because where this therapy initially is headed is to replace bone marrow transplants. And so that's been a long held dream of mine is, is to have something that can be less toxic and more widely available than, for instance, we, you know, we discussed this morning session, our first patient, Emily Whitehead, is an only child and didn't have a real mm -hmm. bone marrow donor that could be identified. So you had showed a slide earlier today where there are trials clearly going on in the United States. There were very few in Europe. There were, there were trials in China. I believe you mentioned one mm -hmm. in Australia. I was just wondering why you thought there were so few in, in Europe. 
There's a big disparity between where trials are being done compared to where the science is. So the basic science is, you know, there, uh, Europe is, you know, uh, right at the same level the United States is. If you look at productivity mm -hmm. and, and the, the advances. And it turns out to do translational trials with new kinds of therapies, especially that involve gene transfer, which mm -hmm. car therapies do, the Europeans are not at the same level they are in the United States or in China. I think the reason for that is bureaucratic and not scientific. Okay. And one way I think you can understand is that over 15 years ago, I think, genetically modified tomatoes were made, the flavor saver tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So these and other kinds of fruits and so on that have short shelf lives mm -hmm. were made and they were approved in in countries like the US but not in Europe at least not in Germany and right. so so right. I think there's a conservatism there that has led to this and I think that the people in the end will change the regulations because they want access to these earlier today you talked about CAR T data and mm -hmm. hematologic malignancies and could you share with us some of the highlights from your presentation? So, um, you know, we started uh, this, we're early on in this, um, uh, with the first patients treated in 2010, mm -hmm. and then, uh, so, uh, you know, end stage patients. And, you know, fortunately those data have held up, um, and uh, we've just reported that, you know, they have remained in remission and are leukemia free. In fact, in, in November, there was a, a special on in New York City on our first patient, Bill Ludwig, and it showed him celebrating five years leukemia free. He was on the front page of the New York Times in 2011. And, you know, he's a retired prison warden, lives in New Jersey. At that point, he had lost 40 pounds and, I mean, and uh, was really skeletal when we treated him. Didn't think he would live even to Christmas. We treated him in, in July 31st, and I'll never forget that. <laughs> and he, uh, over the period after we treat him in a year, he gained all that weight back. And then he actually bought a, an RV. He had sold everything, didn't think he was even <laughs> going to make the kit to, uh, to Christmas uh -huh. and to see his grandkids. And now what he was on TV just recently was, is, you know, five years later, he has this big RV and he's going around the country okay. seeing his grandchildren. That is a great yeah. result. <laughs> so, so we've gone, you know, from very few patients treated. We now know those initial responses were durable. Mm -hmm. And at the University of Pennsylvania, we've treated more than 200 patients. And, you know, this is going to become worldwide. Novartis, a number of other companies now are commercializing what's being done and, you know, making it scaled out. So, because right now, unfortunately, it's not at community hospitals. Okay. So right now it's at very specialized cancer centers. And in the United States, it's around probably 10 or 15 cancer centers you can get this but people have to travel to get those. And, and so it's becoming worldwide. I'm always asking, you know, how can something that's done one by one like that, you know, from starting the patient's own T cells become something that can become routine? And the answer is, is it's called scale out. So in the biotechnology revolution, we had to scale that up, meaning making small, you know, recombinant proteins, make it into kilogram amounts, and the mm -hmm. industry learned how to do that. That's how we have a biotechnology industry. And now what has to happen with these kind of cell therapies is they have to be made robotic and made automatic. And in 2013, the bone marrow transplant organization, there's an international bone marrow transplant registry, announced that they had done their millionth bone marrow transplant. And the way they did that is it was initially at very specialized centers in the United States and then it became worldwide and it became available where every hospital could do it. Good. So, so they, they learned how to do that. We're going to have to Good. teach all the oncologists, but there will be companies where they will manufacture these cells and then they'll be shipped and it should be available to everyone, you know, over the next, you know, five to 10 years is, is what will happen. Okay, so a lot to look forward to. I read yeah. about community therapeutics. 
Timunity is the first company actually started by the University of Pennsylvania. It began with my colleagues, you know, Bruce Levine began working with me in 1992. And there are a total of five founders from Timunity. Okay. So it's University of Pennsylvania, University of Minnesota, and we've been working on various kinds of therapies. So we think that these cell therapies are not just going to be CAR T cells in our, for leukemia, but that will be in the future used for graft versus host disease, and we've done that with Bruce Blazer at the University of Minnesota, and then for autoimmune disease. So that you, not only can you turn up the immune system, but you can turn it down with engineered cell therapies, and then infections. So we've been working for over a decade now on HIV, and Jim Riley is one of the people in our group who has very exciting new kinds of cell therapies for HIV, so that in the long run it may be possible not to have to take drugs every day, like which is what happens for HIV, but to have a cell therapy where it could the immune system could then control it. So that's what Timunity is all about. It's a very early stage biotech. Well, congratulations on that. Well, thank very, you. Yeah. Ex very exciting. I have to ask you about Moonshot, Obama uh, <laughs> Biden's Moonshot, and tell us about your involvement with that. I think it's a very apt name. I mean, the Moonshot happened back in the 60s when the Soviets caught us off guard and they launched Sputnik before we would have done that. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'll tell you, I mean, my grandmother died at the age of 94, <laughs> and she never actually believed that we landed on the moon. <laughs> so moonshots are, in a way, something where you do something that you think it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think the term moonshot is, is a great idea where the public needs to learn a lot about this new kind of immune therapy for cancer. Mm -hmm. and, and for all the, it's moving faster than most people can understand. So we need a big education mission so that the people uh, and public understand what's possible, but also they uh, understand it's gonna take time. I mean, this is a long-term research mission and we wanna not go just to the moon, but to places like beyond that, to Mars, et cetera. And how are we gonna do that? It's gonna take research, a long-term research effort, and one by one, diseases previously thought uncurable or incurable mm -hmm. should become mm -hmm. curable. So that's what the moon shot's about. It's, it's accelerating the rate of research so that we can get there faster than it would otherwise happen. Okay. Well, thank you for helping make that possible well, and for leading the efforts. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks.